In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. An angel appears in a cloud of incense to a man and says to him, Son, because you lived a good and a virtuous life, I am allowed to offer you a gift. You can be the most handsome man in the whole world, or you can have infinite wisdom, or you can have limitless wealth. The man reflected and said to the angel, I think I'll take the wisdom. Then wisdom shall be yours, said the angel, disappearing from his sight. But the smoke had barely cleared before the man thought to himself, I should have taken the money. Earlier in the service, the choir sang this verse from Psalm 90. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Today we launch our annual appeal for 2022 while we're still in a pandemic. However, I'm filled with optimism, or should I say hope, because of the way that parishioners, friends and supporters responded to last year's appeal when the pandemic was truly fearful. At St. Thomas Church, we know that we are blessed because of the generosity of the dead, those who have gone before us and have remembered us in their estate plans. But we still need the generosity of the living in order to support our mission and our choir school. Put very simply, our invested funds are simply not enough to cover what it costs to keep this beautiful church and choir school open in the middle of Manhattan, and so again, we appeal for your help. And that appeal is also to the thousand or so of you who are joining us online today. To those of you who are joining us with the on-demand service, we have been surprised, encouraged, and delighted by the generosity of so many of you who during the pandemic have discovered and chosen St. Thomas Church to be your place of refuge, your place of prayer and inspiration, albeit in many cases thousands of miles away. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for supporting us and for coming, becoming a committed member of our worldwide family. Today's gospel reading could not be a better reflection on why we should give to the church and to the choir school because it's not just about the money. So let's look at this passage in which Jesus gives some hard teaching to his disciples and of course to you and to me. First, we notice that the young man is searching for something precious and desirable, eternal life. Now, in the Bible, eternal life is not simply about life after death. It's not simply about reversing our mortality, and it is certainly not about getting our bodies back after death and living for a very long time. After all, would I really want this body back for all eternity? I want a better model, and I want one God that does not wear out. And of course, that's what we'll get. In the Bible, eternal life is a far richer experience than living forever and ever and ever. It is about a quality of life, about reimagining the relationship that we have with God and the relationships we have with those around us, and the relationship we have with our planet. We only have to look at the vision of the new heaven and the new earth at the end of the book of Revelation to understand that. And Jesus himself makes this very clear when he prays passionately to the Father on the night that he was betrayed. 
Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is about relationships and the quality of those relationships. And that now takes us back neatly into the gospel reading. And the answer that Jesus gives to the young man's question as he searches for eternal life. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Because those six commandments are all about relationships with others. Yes, inheriting eternal life is not just about the state of my life in relation to God. It is also about how my life impacts on those around me. At this stage, we hear that the young man has tried to be a faithful Jew, following the Torah to the best of his ability. He says, I've done all that all my life. But was he a driven man? Was he concerned only about his relationship with God? And was his keeping of those six commandments superficial in any way? At that moment, there's the most beautiful line in the gospel. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And from that love came the advice that perhaps the young man was not expecting to hear. You lack one thing, one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. The young man whom Jesus loves cannot cope. In fact, we are told he is shocked and walks away grieving because he is very wealthy, which we could easily interpret as sulking. As always, Jesus gets to the heart of the problem. The young man is so attached to his wealth that it is also affecting the way he deals with his relationships with God and with others. Notice that when the young man comes to Jesus, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As if it were a commodity to be earned or even a reward for services rendered. As Adam MacDonald, our Director of Development, loves to remind me, giving is not transactional, it is transformational. No wonder the young man went away with a heavy heart, no wonder he couldn't follow Jesus. It wasn't simply about money, it was about possessions and relationships. But wait, there's more. This is the Middle East in the first century, and we in the 21st century might miss a subtlety in the text if we simply inherit wealth as cash. Writing recently in a commentary on this passage, Luis Menendez Antunia in the School of Theology at Boston University said this, it usually goes unnoticed that such a wealthy man would likely be the owner of urban and rural properties. I guess he had his home in the Hamptons. We do not know whether such wealth came from an inherited position or trading goods. However, by all first century wealth standards, it is most likely that he would own slaves. 
to take care of his properties, manage his household, or perform several tasks in his financial enterprises. Jesus' injunction to sell all his belongings would consequently mean selling his enslaved people. Similarly, Jesus' request to donate the ensuing earnings to the poor would positively impact the lower ranks of the social order where those slaves resided. I'd never thought of that. I'd always thought of it in terms of money. But it's also about property and relationships. Giving for Jesus is not transactional. It is transformational. It is as much about our relationships as what we do with our wealth. Jesus said to the man, follow me. Recently, I was asked to pledge to a charity that I've been supporting with some practical help. It was a big ask. I wasn't quite expecting it. I already tithed to St. Thomas, and I support other charities, and also my family are back in England. So I had to think long and hard. What struck me about the person who asked me was her commitment to give came from her deep relationship with God and the community which she was attempting to serve. And she described her own sacrificial giving as releasing her from attachment to worldly things and trying to make a difference. Now, to be clear, Jesus is not asking you to be in debt or to give up wealth. But he is asking you and me to think about our relationship with God, our world, and with the people around us. He is asking us to discover what is truly valuable in our lives, as the psalmist prayed, to teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. There is, after all, only one certainty about wealth. When we die... We can't take it with us, but we can use it to make a difference while we are alive. And all through the Hebrew Scriptures and in the example of Jesus, that kind of giving means the person receives more back. That kind, as St. Paul describes it, cheerful giving means they're filled with joy. The theme of our annual appeal this year is belonging and trust, two words that came up powerfully when we surveyed 1,200 people a couple of years ago. Belonging matters, and we belong not just to God but to one another. When we build up trust in one another, God blesses us with unexpected gifts. And none of this is new. Two and a half thousand years ago, King David had his own annual appeal for funds to endow the first temple that his son would build, and the people responded generously. And he did it the right way, as Father Mead taught me to do when I became rector. King David made the example. He showed them how much he was going to give, and then he gave more. And then he said, will you match my gift? He raised an extraordinary amount of money, of materials, even precious stones, and not with a tax, which would have been easy for him as king, but that would have been a transactional exchange. In the book of Chronicles, they're described as free will offerings. Asking for a gift given back to God freely and generously. A transformative gift because the temple was not just God's house. It was also the nation's place of prayer and refuge. And after he had done this big ask, set the example and people responded, he prayed to the Lord. And he was filled with joy, 
Not just because he had given freely himself, but because people responded. And in his beautiful prayer, which you can find in the 29th chapter of the first book of Chronicles, go and read it today, he says this, Who am I and what is my people that we should be able to make this free will offering for all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. All things come from you. And of your own have we given you. It was never David's in the first place. He was just acknowledging God's sovereignty and generosity. And Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Archbishop Rowan Williams, reflecting on that kind of generosity, once said this. If we've really taken the message in, we shall live lives of selfless generosity, always asking how the gifts given us, material or imaginative or spiritual or, or whatever, can be shared in a way that brings other people more fully alive and we shall be able to trust the generosity of others and be free to receive what they have to give to us. Belonging and trust. Or as King David ended his prayer to God. O oh Lord, I know, my God, that you search the heart and take pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. I pray at the end of this pandemic that our annual appeal may result in an offering that is freely and joyfully given. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.